Hello, and welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. Today, we're going to be diving into what things are like for me post-show now that I am 30 weeks or seven and a half months, which was crazy for me to realize, post-show, and especially with not having plans to compete in the foreseeable future. But before we get into that, we do need to talk about the fact that the Packers' playoff chances are just up and up and up and up. They started at like 1% just a few weeks ago. But now we had a great win over the Vikings, stopped Justin Jefferson, and we're going into beating the Lions because they are the same old Lions, and we're going we're gonna to prove that. There's a lot of people that didn't believe in the Packers. You know, they gave up on them. Mm-hmm. And there's people like myself. <laughs> <laughs> and myself. <laughs> like us <laughs> that believed from the very beginning. And now with they control their own destiny. Mm-hmm. And they can make it happen this coming Sunday. Yes. Um, and really turn around a what was a crappy season and turn it into a playoff run, which would be amazing. Yeah. I saw a graph the uh, today. I need to send it to you. And it was like the Packers playoff chances throughout the weeks. And it's like the beginning, it's like mid range. And it goes up to like 80% and it's up there. And then it just bottoms down to that 1%. And now it's like back to 60%, which is insane. I've had like the playoff run on like a, my whiteboard in my office. And at first I was like encouraged. I was like, we can make this happen. Like all of these things that need to happen can happen. And then we were watching a broadcast and it said like Packers have like between one and 8% to make the playoffs. And I was like, well, seeing everything, I thought they could do it. And turns out they can. And it's just been going up. And I do have to give a shout out to Bryn Rapp for getting me an Aaron Rodgers jersey that I love. And I think it brought good luck to us. So I will be wearing it next week as well. We both, we both repped number 12. We did. Little. (laughs) <laughs> we were very, uh, very fortunate this Christmas because of just clients sending gifts. Mm-hmm. They were so kind. Yes. We, we, Gus and Tucker lucked out. They got some, yeah. they got some great, great Tucker. pieces from Miguel, especially yeah. got some portraits um, that Julio made. So if you watch the episode of Miguel and learning more about him, you heard about Julio a little bit, but um, we got some portraits of Gus and Tucker. We got some of them dressed up as like Englishmen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was super fun. Maybe I'll send them over to uh, David. So if you are watching this on YouTube, maybe they'll pop up. Um, and then we got some paw prints um, from a client. And then from our neighbor, when she was watching the dog, she actually got their paw prints and they made like ornaments for us, um, which were really special. So very I, thankful. I think we're going to turn one of the walls in the house just to all the gifts that we've received mm-hmm. of Gus and Tucker. I think it's only fitting. Uh, they deserve it. They run the house, more they specifically do. Tucker. Um <laughs> And all that. And then this weekend, this past weekend, we had New Year's. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Miguel's birthday, which was amazing. It was awesome. So we, we took uh, we took Miguel to Jeff Ruby's. This was his first experience at Jeff Ruby's. And maybe in a future podcast, we'll have him really just walk you through yes, we his should. whole experience oh my gosh. of what Jeff Ruby's was like. <laughs> um, we went to our favorite restaurant with him. It was amazing. And then the next night, we took him to a speakeasy um, called No Soliciting here in Dublin, Ohio. And it was amazing to spend time uh, with him and getting to meet his brother and his sister mm-hmm. and uh, just and and his his buddy Will which was amazing and then for New Year's Eve now as we've talked about a couple times on the podcast Sue and I are not overly <laughs> ambitious with social gatherings going out and doing yes. things as you just heard, two nights in a row, we did something. Mm-hmm. And, and we were up till midnight. Bo- I mean, both yeah. nights. So um, party animals. Yeah. New Year's <laughs> Eve comes around, third night. We go out again. I mean, look at us. We're, we're turning to social butterflies. And we were told we were 100% not going to make it, that people already knew. People they were believe. counting us out, yeah. just like they counted out the Packers. And we said, mm mm mm. We'll prove you wrong. <laughs> well, we are not staying up till midnight. <laughs> well, yeah, we didn't stay up till midnight, but we were there till about 10, 1030. Yes. So, uh, but we were dead asleep before midnight. I think <laughs> we got back and we're asleep within about 20 minutes of yeah. getting home. So we like put the OSU game on and then we're like conked out. Yeah. We're like, oh, we'll see it in the morning. So that was our weekend. I hope you guys had a great weekend. (laughs) Yes, and a happy New Year's, um, which the episode, if you're listening to this kind of in order, um, for the New Year, talking about fighting bears and slaying dragons, um, came out. And we loved being able to read some of your comments over on YouTube and just being able to hear that it was a really beneficial episode starting off the New Year. And we're excited to get to episode 100 here in a second. And then I think it's next episode is 100. Mm. And then we'll get to like 150 this year. 
So that is we're going to get to two hundred. I am <laughs> totally committed. We're going to do two, okay. three, four okay. episodes a day, <laughs> or not a day, <laughs> a day, a week. We're going to crank them out. Oh I think my gosh. I would like to go on a sabbatical. Actually, I'd like to go on a podcast sabbatical. I just disregard you all. You know, my work other... sabbatical, whatever, and just do the podcast. No, no, it'd be a podcast sabbatical. <laughs> um, and disregard all of my other work and just record multiple podcasts every single day. I think that's what I'd like to do. Yes. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll work on it. We have the goal of 150 for sure. Okay. We'll, we'll discuss. We have a, a meeting to discuss some goals for this next year. So okay. we'll see if 200 is going to make it happen. But um, I, we love the podcast, if we you do. can't tell. So <laughs> um, let's go ahead and get into things post-show. So like I said, it's been seven and a half months. Um, we did do a wrap-up of just what my last show of the season was, as well as an episode episode going over your guys's questions and talking about my mentality post show. So if you need to brush up on how things were, you can go check those out. We'll have them linked um, in the show notes below. Um, but now it has been quite some time since then, since we recorded that back in July, and I had finished up prep in May or June, um, and then recorded that right in July after we got back from some travel. So um, with that, before I dive into kind of the process, I wanted to be able to talk to you just a little bit about how you felt like mentally and emotionally since prep has ended for me and obviously for you as taking me through prep. The multiple hats uh, that we wear for one another is, is quite abundant and adding as significant of a hat of me coaching you and you being in contest prep uh, and the coach to cl coach to client dynamic was a hat that we hadn't worn to that capacity just yet. And so it was a, a brand new experience for both of us. And so um, since coming out of the prep and that hat no longer being worn, and I'm still handling your your training and, and your nutrition and those different factors to a degree with your nutrition, um, it's been a big weight off of my shoulders. I think that it, it's it's challenging because uh, it's, it's difficult to complain or, or speak to some of the hurdles that you're experiencing when you're talking to the individual that is part of those hurdles or, or some mm -hmm. of those difficulties. And you, and I don't want you to feel as though that, um, that was a negative to you or you needed to change something. I just really needed to, to speak to some of the adversity that I was experiencing. And we've done a really good job of, of communicating those things post-show. And I, uh, in hindsight would have loved to do a better job during the season. But again, it was a new experience for both of us that I don't think that um, we were in a place to be able to communicate or we would have, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, since then, it's been a big weight lifted off my shoulders, like I said. And um, emotionally, I, I think that I'm just more, I'm back to being you know, fully open with you. I mm -hmm. think that it was uh, something that I, I try, or I guess it caused me to be more reserved or, or trying to hide certain emotions because I had to have certain emotions in certain scenarios to where, um, like for example, within the show and, and some of the shows not going the way that we had hoped, it's difficult because as your husband, I just wanted to to be there for you and to uh, be upset with you and be frustrated with you. But from a coaching standpoint, I can't do that. Yeah. Like that's just not the the place for me to sit. It, it's not uh, the the professional thing, nor what the role of the coach is there to do. They're there to um, put the best plan in place for success, as well as when things don't go the right way, it's it's time to figure out why they didn't go that right way, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to have the the correct direction and right the ship immediately. And that's always was my mentality, and that was that was heavy on me. That was very mm -hmm. challenging to navigate through. And so having all of that be removed out of my day to day. Um, and it, it, it made me, the whole experience made me a better coach through and through, through multiple components. And we may dig in that into that more today, more specifically. Um, but it, it enhanced our, it enhanced our relationship through the adversity, through the challenges. I think that, um, we, strengthened our relationship abundantly from it. Uh, and I got to be a, a much better coach throughout the process as well. Yeah. And I first want to say that I, I did feel supported from you as a husband and as a coach throughout prep. And I think that it was honestly self-preservation to a certain degree for both of us of not being fully open. And I don't know if it would have been beneficial for us to be fully open just because you can't be everything for everyone. And we are a lot for one another. And I love that because I love you. <laughs> um, but there are times where just like your emotional cup 
runneth over. And we can't always take on all of each other's emotional energy. And we can't also solve every, like, I can't solve all of your problems and you can't solve all of mine. And I think that taught us in that situation of putting us in the place that we did have to wear so many hats more than we normally do of realizing, oh, I can't put this all on one person. And so I was very thankful that towards the end of prep, we did have some honest conversations. And I think that, again, that was the right time for them to happen because we were getting to the point of like, hey, this is ending. Like, we really need to discuss where our headspace is at and be able to give each other space or whatever the, the other person needs in that moment. And so it was helpful because, you know me, I would have carried so much more guilt knowing that you were struggling the way that you were. And not that, oh, like I should just be ignorant to it so that I don't feel guilty. But I think, again, not only were you having self-preservation for yourself, but you were recognizing that like I was likely going to feel bad that you felt bad. And that wasn't going to help our odds or our chances at bringing the best physique. And so I I did feel supported by you. And I'm so glad that we were able to have the open conversations and you were able to vocalize where you were struggling just because so much of prep is focused on the competitor and what the competitor is struggling with. Sometimes it's hard to kind of open that door to what the spouse or the significant other is struggling with. And then on top of it, all the other layers that we have. Um, but uh, within you talking about it, making you a better coach, one thing that we've had conversations about that I was really interested in and intrigued with and also had similar thoughts was that you mentioned that with the emotion you carried towards me and towards the prep, that you felt like in order to be a good coach, you had to be that invested and that emotional. How do you feel like that's changed or your mindset towards it has changed since my prep finished up? I think that it has changed in the sense that I can have tremendous care towards a client's health and their well-being and their success without being overly emotionally invested in them as as individuals. That's not a, a knock on the clients. I think that it was something that from my experience within the coaches that I have had, not only just from a, a bodybuilding standpoint, but even, you know, into my childhood, I think that like my dad was a, a coach for me all growing up through multiple sports. And so that's my example mm -hmm. from a coaching standpoint, outside of what I've learned from other coaches in other spaces, like my, my coach growing up was my dad. And, and so the, obviously the closeness and bond that I had with him throughout the entire experience is, is my example that I carried on into my own coaching, which has been of large benefit. Like it, it, it's not a, it's not a negative thing. No, not at all. Um, it has allowed for me to build such incredible relationships with so many of my clients, people that I can look at who were complete strangers when they you know, came into working with me and have been working with me for a year, two years, three years, some even beyond that, that I can look at and be like, I love that person. Like that is, that is someone who I really, really admire, someone who I really like. And I can put in a category of like, this is one of my favorite people mm -hmm. because of the, the ability to connect in those different aspects. Um, but this also can be a detriment in the sense of contest prep when you've got to push somebody past some limits um, and, and take them to a more challenging place as a whole and it not being the, the easiest to do so. And um, I think that the experience with you, there's not been a client, I can assure you guys, <laughs> there's not a client that I've cared more about. Um, and if anyone takes offense to this, I, I guess I apologize. <laughs> I, I guess offense. I, yeah. <laughs> um, that I care more about than, than you. And it was an experience where I, there was multiple times where I had to push you past boundaries that... Um, you know, weren't the the easiest to do. You know, mm -hmm. taking your food down to to, to certain places, uh, elevating your cardio, seeing the the challenge that it was on you every single day to do all the tasks that you had, and trying to take all of that into consideration. I've talked about this in the the other podcast where I was just constantly on. Mm -hmm. I was constantly taking inventory of what you were doing, how you were feeling, um, your mannerisms, your emotions, um, all those different things were being taken into this inventory data collection. My mind is, is, um, 
one in which runs 24 seven regardless. And the fact that I had something that was so important to me at my immediate disposal from the moment I woke up to the time I went to bed was not as helpful as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. It was more of a, a negative than I thought it would be in the challenge of like, just not letting my wife be my wife. Yeah. And, uh, you know, taking every little thing, even if it was, it was said lightheartedly, I took too much inventory into that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, you know, I'm getting to your check-in once or twice or how many times we're checking in that week. Uh, I'm taking all of that inventory from what was said into account alongside the information that you're presenting to me, which is already sufficient enough. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was eye-opening to me. That was something that I did not realize that I was actively doing until after the fact. And I believe that after your prep, I've been able to have an opportunity where um, I've been able, like I've had some of my greatest results with clients after your prep mm -hmm. in part to, I, I think in part to all that, where yeah. it was just a, a level of realization. And also the aspect of like, I came up short on what up to this point has been one of my most important goals. And I'm, I'm unwilling to, to feel that way again. And with that, it has driven me to just be better, to be more detailed in the things that truly matter and not getting too emotional. I'm an emotional person. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm emotional in the sense of like, um, I don't know, I wear, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I do a very poor job of, of hiding how I feel <laughs> in certain scenarios. And so my emotions can play a large role in the decisions I'm making. And I think that this year or 2022, what's up, uh, 2023, <laughs> new year, uh, last year was a, a time where I really was able to start disconnecting my level of, of emotion and, and have greater intelligence around that to be able to compartmentalize better within my decision making. And it's only been for the better. Yeah. And I think that like the detail orient oriented aspect really helped both of us of recognizing like we already knew that there were so many specifics to prep and so many details to be aware of. But I felt like somehow we learned more specificity towards each of those details and how we needed to coach to be better in those aspects. And so I 100% agree with you. And I do think that emotion can be an extremely powerful aspect and connection is so important to us. Um, and with that being said, I can't forget to mention a shout out to my client, Kate, for the Jeff Ruby's gift card that we are able to, um, you know, go on to Jeff Ruby's. So um, with that, just like that, that care that you can connect with your clients, but again, not have that over emotional reaction and be able to see those details because over like having too much emotion in that and letting that ride you can lead you astray as a coach um, of like over correcting. And I feel like you've done an incredible job and just produced incredible results. I already thought you were, but I really do like see a difference between like your ability to like get a transformation and incredible results alongside that, not just like, oh, here's a cool physical transformation. It's like the blurbs that you send alongside it of what your clients are saying, like you've become a better coach for sure. Um, and I know that you have different goals and aspirations coming into this next competition season. And I'm really excited to see those come to fruition because I, I know you're going to make that happen. And you have obviously my support through it. Um, and just there, there's so much good coming and being able to like the theme of I feel like 2022 was us like turning our L's into lessons of like anything that we thought was a loss or an L like we truly looked at it and we're like how can I grow from this or how can I learn from this and I feel like that's contributed so much to the people that we started the year as versus ended the year as um, was being able to really cohesively learn from the mistakes or the tribulations that we had. I would say this is probably the most transformative year for us. Mm -hmm. It was a year where we were uh, dealt adversity that could have allowed us to kind of pitter patter away and and shy away from it all and go the opposite direction and um un, un not uncharacteristically but unlike our personality previously mm -hmm. where we would have been more people pleasing in those different you know 
aspects. We rose to the occasion and, and really stood up for what we believed in, stood up for what um, we felt to be right and and had conviction within that. And I would I would say that this, that's another big word for 2022 is just having conviction because it was something where it, it would have been so easy just to continue to uh, shrink ourselves and and allow for all these things to kind of like overcome us, but we continue to to trust in one another, trust in the things that we have in motion, and uh, that's going to that's what set up this year to be such a beautiful one for us because of all the the hard work that we did last year. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Yeah, 100%. So I, I am very thankful while there's still things that, of course, we might have like a bitter taste in our mouth throughout the the season. I think that overall it was a really positive experience. And I think a big thing for me and some of the questions, because I did put a question box up on Instagram and there are some really great questions in there. And a lot of it was just kind of like how I'm doing with like not having that goal or switching that goal. Um, and so I do want to be able to dive into that of just kind of what that's looked like for my mentality and just for our ever-changing relationship of those roles that we play together. So like I said, I am 30 weeks post-show. I did actually stop, or I should say pause, checking in um, eight weeks ago. So two months, and obviously these past two months have been November and December. So things have been pretty crazy. And the reason I paused checking in was because at the end of November, not only was, are the end of October, November. Yeah. End of October is when we got the flu. And so I checked in that last week of October and then it was my birthday. And then it was like craziness going into the holidays. And like I mentioned in the last podcast, talking about my dad and his diagnosis, all of that was happening at the same time. And so it wasn't that, oh, I fell off the wagon or Alex wasn't helping me anymore. It was being realistic of where both of our bandwidths were, as well as how beneficial a check-in would have been for ourselves in that situation. I mean, I've been competing and been in and out of prep for over six years. And so I know what the, the process looks like post-show. And that was a really helpful aspect of knowing what to expect and having experienced it before. And I also often tell my own clients, and I know Alex does the same, of expect or have the mindset that you're in prep. Like, six to eight weeks past when the show ends. Like you need that stability and that attention to detail to have the best hormonal health as well as to have the results that you're really wanting in that time frame. And so I had 22 weeks of like really hammering down and I'll kind of talk through the process. Um, and then when just we got sick, it was like, hey, I'm sick. Like there's no reason for us to check in. We're kind of behind on work. Like let's just get this done. And then it was everything going on with my dad and I just didn't have have the emotional capacity to sit down and track every aspect that I had been. And a really cool thing was just that I didn't like go crazy or lose my habits as I had such a foundation of habits and structure that just some things that weren't as important in that moment fell to the wayside. So I was still regularly eating similar foods outside of the nausea and being sick, which also played a role. Um, but I was still eating the same foods having the same structure to my routine of going on walks and moving my body, um, as well as just being able to have, again, the whole health foundation of our lives um, in place. But other things needed my attention, and it was something that I just was so drawn to being able to help my family and take care of clients, and that's really all that mattered for a period of time. Um, and then the holidays happening, we had some travel in place and just out of routine. And not that anytime you're out of routine that it doesn't make sense to check in with your coach, but the circumstances withstanding both of us being on the same page and understanding where things were coming from, as well as one of the things that I did to help myself of I knew in that moment with so many variables going crazy that like looking at um, pictures of myself or like over analyzing the data that I've done 
done for so many years, not always overanalyzing, but just analyzing the data that it could have put me in a worse headspace. And so I was very aware of that. And it was just of like, do the habits and be a part of the routines that you know make you feel better. And like, I feel like I have a deep understanding of my health and what health means to me mentally, emotionally, physically. And just being able to focus on those aspects was just the way that I kept myself afloat and taking one thing off my plate of checking in. And I also want to do good by Alex. Like I would never want to be the client that he's like, oh, they check in and then they just don't implement anything that I say, or they're super off routine. And then they're giving me a half-assed check-in. Like I didn't want to do that to Alex. And so I had told him like the first weeks, I was like, I'm not checking in because I'm sick. I'm not checking in because of this. And then like I had missed a week and he was like, hey, were you were you going to check in? What was the situation? And I was like, I, I just need a second. And he was extremely respectful of that. And as well as not taking it personally, like it wasn't, again, I, can, I can't make it clear enough. It was nothing that he wasn't giving me. I just needed some space. And we plan on picking up check-ins here into the new year. Um, now that I'm in a, a better routine and things have calmed down a little bit um, on a, a multitude of horizons in our life. Um, but that's kind of an, an overview of some of the things that have happened in this time frame. Um, and then I'll kind of dive into some more specifics to get you guys up updates on exactly what happened post-show as a whole. I think that one of the things that I say with clients is that the amount of good repetitions you've had in a post-show experience or a um, reverse diet in general allows for there to be greater flexibility in future uh, reverse diets or or post-show periods. And so what I mean by that is that if it's your first post-show reverse, I'm going to be a little bit more on you. I'm mm-hmm. going to be messaging a little bit more consistently. We're going to be having more consistent conversation because this is your first experience. It's it's hard to understand the hormonal fluctuations, how you're feeling, how you're looking, the changes in the gym, all those different factors. There's a lot happening. And so it's really important to be very hands-on in that period, as well as very transparent with your coach as you're going through these, these changes. But as you have multiple reverses, multiple post shows, like get, using Sue as the example here, she's had a lot of really, really good reps post show. And so it's not something that I, I would be shocked if it went array. Like yeah. it, it, I would have been more surprised if things went south um, than the way that they did. They were, they went exactly how I would have anticipated them to. Even with all the adversity, there was things that came up and she still stayed the course um, within those things. And so there's a little bit of, of greater grace given in which that is earned from the great repetitions that she's already had. So always take that into context when you are working with a coach and and those different factors, because every single reverse diet or or post-show period that I've had with clients this year has been dealt differently depending on what their experience level is, as well as where their emotional state is at, where they're at physically. All these things are taken into consideration because of the detailed work that we're doing within the check-ins, the detailed work that we're doing within our communication, and all those different factors. And so your reverse is not going to look like another person's. It may look very similar, but it's not going to be the exact same because you're two different individuals with two different experiences, and you have to be cognizant of that when you're going through this this process. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned that because I think it is so important to realize like everyone's post show is going to be different. And I do feel like there is such a benefit or a a leg up, if that's the right phrasing, uh, if you've been through it before of like, you know what to expect as well as you've taken your body to that level and you've gone back and forth from it. And outside of just the shows that I've prepped for, I've gone through multiple like bulks and cuts like around those preps. And so being able to realize like, hey, for for six or seven years, I was consist like extremely consistent within every metric of tracking my food, hitting my food, hitting my water, getting my gym sessions, getting my cardio sessions, like checking all of the boxes for that length of time. And I think people overlook that and just think it should be that easy the first time, or you should look the way that someone who's done it for six years when you've done it for the first year does 
that happen every once in a while of a first time competitor looking as incredible as like in their post show and throughout it of someone who's done it for multiple years. Yeah, of course it happens, but it's not the rule. It's the exception. And being able to look at like a picture came up from post show, my first show and how different my body composition was as well as how different the my lifestyle and the allowances for my lifestyle were based on what goals I had. And I think that's so important to be able to understand as a coach and as an athlete or a competitor is just that like pay attention to what you have done and what your experience is and build off of that instead of trying to just copy pasta over to someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, so like I said, November and December, I was honestly sick on and off. Um, it might be a story for another time, but found out we have chlorine all up in our water. Um, and not just a little chlorine. It was a lot, a lot of chlorine, a lot of chlorine. Um, it's, it's very unfortunate. Yes. We're getting it fixed here this week. So we should be all set. Um, but we found out that was causing a lot of our headaches and stomach aches that we we're having pretty regularly. It wasn't even on and off. They were very regular, um, as well as I had the flu, and then I had a cold, and then a stomach bug. And so throughout all of that, again, that's a huge variable in how your body is going to respond when you are sick. And so being able in those moments to really focus on rest and fluids and being able to get food in are going to be the priority. So there were multiple weeks that I didn't train for a full week or more, and there were multiple weeks, um, or I should say days that I didn't get really any movement in as far as like getting up and going for a walk. And that was difficult for me because my health is so important and I've worked so hard for my health. But it also allowed me to honor myself and my body through that and being able to give myself grace of like, your body's not going to look the way it would if you if you weren't sick or if you weren't going through this. And you need to give yourself grace and set appropriate expectations for like how your body is going to look going through this. And so with being sick, like I gave myself immense grace of not, hey, now you can just eat and act like an asshole, but like you have to understand that if you're sick, you're going to be inflamed or you might have these different symptoms or your body might look a little bit different. Um, and there's so many different aspects to take into consideration. And so knowing and understanding those variables was so important for me. So people had asked about my mindset post-show, and a lot of it came from truly learning about my body and understanding my body. And I can't say enough about doing that for yourself because otherwise it just kind of feels like, wacky within the inputs of like, I don't know what's going on. And so the more that you can understand that and have someone to talk to about that, where having you as a coach throughout that was very, very helpful just to have the guidance, to have someone who is objective. Um, and even though I understood the aspects, just to have that reminder of like, you're on the right path, like rest, like take the rest and like, let's go. Because it's easy to second guess yourself of like, I'm being soft. I should just get up and go train. And I had some moments of that. And when you, I don't want to say gave me permission because I don't need permission to rest, but like when you echoed, like you do need to rest, like that was so helpful for my peace of mind to take care of myself instead of feeling like I was letting you down or that I was being soft in that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that the rest in this period has been a tremendous need for you, whether you are sick or not. I think that we would have taken a couple of weeks off of training regardless if you got sick because of what the year has been um, from a, a personal standpoint, from a train or from a you know, prep standpoint, all those different factors. You needed the time off. And, and if you were listening to this and you're like, I train every single day, every single week type mm -hmm. situation each year, like there's going to be phases where the rest itself is probably going to be the best thing for your hypertrophy progress as possible because where we're seeing the, the growth to the tissue or the um, densification of those muscle fibers is really going to be when you're recovering, not when you're continuing to train. And so if you're just constantly, um, 
<clears throat> having the the damage to the tissue with your training and not having that recovery period, you're not going to see the progress that you want to see. And so that that application and that aspect of, of resistance training applies to every aspect of your life. And so there's so many things within resistance training that are applicable to your day to day. And that's one of those things where you've got to have seasons of, of pushing harder. You have to have seasons of pulling back. You have to have seasons of rest. And that was just, you know, what was needed for you post-show. Yeah. And I think it's good to be able to look at your trainability and your recoverability of you have like your stress in your life and your normal stress and training is of stress and that piles on. And then if there's any extra things, so relational stress, work stress, life stress, like just, I mean, there's so many things that could cause stress as well as like pushing yourself harder or being sick as a stress, then you've maxed out where your stress is at and what you can recover from. And training past that just because like you want to train is only causing more like, um, more stress on the body. More stress on the body and less results on the body as well. And so like more isn't always better. And that was really helpful for me to understand. Um, and so going ahead and talking about rest directly post-show, and I know we touched on this, but this was just a week or two post-show where the last podcast was. Um, I actually loaded for Francois on higher carbs and food than I ever had for a show. We had had some ex um, examples from the past peaks um, and we went up and pushed higher fats and carbs than we had in post shows. And that's the greatest that I've ever looked in my whole entire life. It was freaking awesome. Um, and peaked on higher fat. So historically throughout prep, I've been low fats and even post prep and past seasons, I've been anywhere from 40 to 50 grams of fat. Um, and so within going into post show and peaking, I peaked on around 60 grams of fat and then directly post show, I'm gonna say just some of these numbers cause there's not too many, um, but just to show kind of the pro progression that we we went on here. Um, but directly post-show, and uh, I don't know exactly what the, quote, lowest food was all season because it there's on a lot of text back and forth from us. And honestly, I don't really care to compare like my absolute lowest on one day of a peak to something else. But directly post-show, we moved to 150 protein, 150 carb, and 50 fat. Um, and then about five to seven days later, we moved to 200 carb from that. So we added 50 carb. Carb. Um, I also, we went to Chattanooga and I had two or three meals out, which were the first few meals that I had had out in a while. Um, and then we moved up 15 more grams to 215. Um, and then um, about a week or so later, moved on up to um, 15 more carbs to 230 and added in five grams of fat. So now we're at 150 protein, 230 carb, and 55 fat. And then we went ahead and moved things up again a week or two later into 265 carbs, so 35 carb added and 60 fat, so five fat added. And then food has kind of held around this spot of 140 protein, 270 carb, and 70 fat is kind of where I've been at for multiple months now. Um, and within that food, I'm not going to act like I've hit it every single day. Now, Sue post-show last time, which one of the questions was, how do you feel like you've done post-show um, versus last post-show? And it's just that I've had more flexibility just because I don't have that specific goal and I've been able to rest and listen to my body a little bit more. Um, so I haven't hit that every single week. There were some times within being sick as well as travel and just emotionally being drained that I under ate. Um, and that was something I really was proactive about and have been proactive about making sure I get in enough food. Um, and then we've also had more flexibility within eating out as a whole, which has been fun to kind of play around with. Um, and I'm going to touch on that of kind of how we found that balance for ourselves and um, like us as a whole. Um, but the thing I wanted to touch on specifically and how we were able to raise food up um, a little bit faster and get it to as high as we did, as fast as we did. Um, so one aspect is my metabolism of I've, again, had six plus years of being consistent, nailing the variables and making my meta metabolism better to be able to handle more food and have a different body composition with more muscle mass on me to look the way that I want to 
at that higher food or weight intake, our food intake or weight, um, as well as um, being able to manage my health throughout the prep of Alex ensured that I was in the absolute healthiest spot. This was the longest that I kept my cycle um, during a show or during a prep, and it was the fastest that I got a cycle back and got it back rather regularly off the bat. Um, and some of the best my blood work overall has looked in comparison to past preps. So staying healthy throughout my prep and making sure I wasn't too inflamed um, to even receive food post-show of people just going, again, too much stress and just going, going, going. And then their body kind of reverts the opposite way. And then um, being able to really push the gauntlet within training after that first week of resting. So right post-show, I took some days completely off of training. And then we kind of eased in of just moving my body and like what felt good and having fun in the gym and just kind of building sessions out together. Um, but then you pushed me into a hypertrophy phase and you said train. Um, and that's a, a big part of how we were able to get food up. Yeah. I think that that's another thing this year is that I've been able to be a little bit more aggressive with the uh, reverse period. I, I think that there's kind of tiptoe because if you take too slow an approach through a reverse, you're in this situation where you're just prolonging the dieting phase and just keeping everything at suboptimal ranges, whether that be from a hormonal function standpoint, training progression, uh, training recovery, sleep quality, all those things. And so I, I think that, and I, I've also seen this be uh, more talked about from a social standpoint with other coaches is that I think that other coaches are also kind of getting on this wave of being more aggressive after about four or five weeks after that revert or since the, the last show um, to be able to get back to what we would perceive to be a caloric maintenance for you sooner. Um, and I've seen cycles be restored quicker Mm -hmm. I've seen training performance improve drastically, and I haven't seen what I would have imagined, let's say a couple of years ago with this type of approach. I would have imagined that body fat would have been added pretty rapidly, mm -hmm. and it's not much different. Um, it honestly is better, especially from a mental headspace standpoint. Mm -hmm. And depending on the athlete, you know, that's the, the the few things that you're assessing is the the uh, headspace that the individual is in, as well as where they're at physically. What are their goals? What how quickly we're we trying to attain the next said goal, and those different factors. And then that's what scripts the next you know reverse and, and the pace that's needing to be set in those different factors. And so again, this is just something that <clears throat> was specific to Sue uh, within the the protocols themselves, and I think that it was successful. Yeah. And it's something that with engaging kind of where clients at, I had a client um, finish up her season in the fall and we had a few days of rest. Um, and then sometimes during people's peak, it feels like you're super well rested because you're getting more food and not training as hard. Um, and so after her show, a few days after we got on a call and discussed how things went, what her goals were. And I was like, truthfully, like, be so honest with me. Do not tell me just what you think I want you want you to say or want to hear hear from you, but how recovered do you feel? Do you feel still like achy and sore and that you want to rest? Or are you feeling like really good, motivated, ready to get after it? And that's where I could kind of gauge of, okay, let's push that training button a little harder. Let's push food up a little bit more. Um, and that was really helpful to just have that touch point. So if you're a client or if you're a coach, like making sure that conversation happens and you're on the same page. And we do a lot of our coaching, not all of it, but a lot of it based on where someone's headspace is because that's how you can truly know how to push them. And again, it's, it's not cookie cutter. It's looking at the variables and understanding what's going to be best for the best results for that client based on where they're at there. Yeah. And, and to the individual who is like, I don't want to, I'm, I'm embarrassed by how I handled uh, how I ate after the show, or I'm embarrassed because I overconsumed and I don't want to share it with my coach because I'm embarrassed. It's like, that's the worst possible thing you could do for yourself. The clients that are the most successful are the ones that are the most transparent and the most honest and vulnerable within their check-ins to allow for the data to be most reflective of what's actually happening. The I, I cannot understand individuals paying for a service <clears throat> botching the numbers because they want to save face and then then they don't get the right results because the situation was not what it was written yeah. to be 
And then it's like, like, what's the point? Yeah. Because of that instantaneous moment of like, emotionally, I can't commit to being embarrassed Mm -hmm. for what, 30 seconds, a minute. Like, I I think that also like this also there, this is multifactorial because there are individuals who have had coaches in their past who they've screwed up one time, they've made one mistake and they get like scolded for that. And shamed and, and shamed. guilted. It's and so it's so weird. And I, I think that that culture is is dying away. I mean, at least the the coaches that are in my immediate circle, myself, uh, the coaches on the physique development staff, no one coaches that way. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that that culture is becoming more popularized, which is an amazing thing. But if, if you're in a situation where your coach is, is belittling you for for small mistakes that are human mistake. Like it is, it's simple to make these mistakes. Mm-hmm. And it's just a matter of, of creating better routines and, and better understanding of mentality and all the, like there's, there's, it's multifactorial, but it's, it's not as, as, um, life ending as some people make it to be. Yeah. And getting to that place where you're just being as honest as possible is going to be the biggest help for you ever. Yeah. And just to put it in a different scenario in regards to like kind of lying or misleading your coach for that information, like imagine you hire like a um, financial advisor and you want the numbers to make them proud or you, again, don't want to be embarrassed that things didn't happen how they were supposed to happen or based on the plan that was put in place. And then you just start writing in higher numbers. That didn't make it true. Again, you didn't hit the result and you're likely not in a good financial space because of it. And it didn't help you. It didn't help your financial advisor. And you're likely really upset with the product that you got because, again, you didn't share that information. And so being able to look at it and possibly a different scenario might help within clarity of like, I would never lie on that to just make that happen. It's the same thing. And you can ask any of our clients of like, how our responses, if they've ever, quote, messed up or like made a mistake or overeaten or anything that they could possibly be embarrassed about, like none of us have ever berated them or belittled them for doing so. It's normally met with, thank you so much for telling me this was really helpful so I can adjust the game plan. Let's talk on why this happened. Let's make a plan for this moving forward and make sure that we can go off on to the sunset still achieving our goals. So yes, it is one of the biggest mistakes you can make by just not telling when you do possibly make a mistake. Uh, we're here to, to help you and to keep guiding you through that um, as a whole. So Heading into my last show, I was in a neuro phase. Um, And then, like I said, directly after we went into the hyper phase to be able to raise food up a little bit more, Um, we went into a metabolic phase, um, then another hyper, and then another metabolic phase. Um, And within this last metabolic phase, um, I've had it for a few weeks now um, past like the time that I would normally stay in it. But there were some missed sessions from being sick, being out of town, um, and I've been going off of that as well as doing some sessions with Alex. Sometimes when I'm just like, okay, I need to get out there. I'll go out there and go through some movements I really want to work on. Um, but like I said, we're getting back into check-ins. So we'll kind of reset and redecide what needs to happen within training. Um, and that wasn't like, I never took any of that of like me failing and not doing what was supposed to happen. It was again, really accepting where I was and where my priorities were of my health was a top priority. My family was a top priority and work was a top priority. And outside of that, some of those possibly more aesthetic or training goals didn't fall by the wayside, but they became a little bit less of a priority. And I understood that and accepted that, which was really helpful through the process. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. So heading into some of these questions here um, and making sure that I address all of them as well as being able to talk about some things that have helped me. Um, So I got questions about my cardio routine, if training has changed or how training and nutrition has changed versus last post-show. So cardio routine, this is something I did want to talk about. Directly post-show, all my cardio on the treadmill was dropped out and I was told to only do outside 
sidewalks for my cardio. Um, and I had a step goal, which was honestly phenomenal. It not only got me into the routine of going for walks outside that I love so dearly now, um, but it helped within my recovery of being out in the sun was going to help me getting vitamin D, having fresh air, um, as well as just there is quite a difference from walking on the like outside versus walking on a treadmill um, and that experience as a whole. And I think Alex really understood that and really was able to read what I needed. And so being able to drop out all of the, oh, hey, you got to go be on that treadmill for 45 minutes um, into like, hey, you're going to go on outside walks for this duration of time. You're going to have this as your minimum step goal was extremely beneficial. And that's kind of what we've kept up since then is just having outside walks almost every single day um, and being able to have a step goal, which has been incredible for myself and how I feel and just being able to know again like movement is very important to me fresh air is important getting these wacky dogs on a W each day um, to get some energy out is really important so that's how my cardio has changed and it's been incredible I want to continue to reiterate as she I didn't realize you're going to be giving very specifics to your protocols I want to reiterate, this is for Sue specifically. Yes. Please do not take this as like, well, since Sue did it, I'm going to drop all of my cardio because again, I, I was with her every single day, tons of data collection. I understand the different factors of, of how her body responds to things. So please don't take this as like, well, I should drop all my cardio too because Sue did it and she looks great and so on and so forth. So yes. This is, I mean, I'm talking about my post-show experience and I'm answering your guys' questions on what we did for me. And so just being able to give some insight on kind of how things have gone, because post-show, especially if you're not in competing, or maybe you are scared to like admit that you are in a place that you're not wanting to compete in the future, of just knowing what someone else's experiences can be very helpful. So yes, huge disclaimer, this is what I did, what we did for me, and I even said within cardio of Alex really took me into consideration and making that call. Um, And that's not a call that's made across the board. Um, So within training, training's pretty much stayed the same as it would if I was going into another show or just like, again, my goals in general. I love to train. I love to be able to um, body build as a whole. And just there, there's always going to be an extreme love for training and being able to better my physique. Um, so training, I would say, has stayed pretty on par for what I was already doing and what I would be doing for the most part if I was going into another show. Yeah. And I don't think that there was a whole lot that was changed there. I think that exercise selection stayed similar. Uh, we were on the lower end of, of where we've uh, found your volume to be tolerable uh, with the calories that were in place and those different factors. And then we've really, uh, the, the initial goal was to be able to titrate that up and, and those different aspects that hasn't happened um, quite yet. We've, we've had phases where we titrated it up and then, you know, life was life and, and we've been kind of in a, a, not necessarily a standstill. I think that uh, making progress in other facets um, Mm -hmm. would be a better uh, definition for it. And so um, that's, that's the intent is that we're still going to have the focus of adding tissue, you know, going into the rest of the year, a lot of our exercise selection is going to stay the same. Um, It's not as, as I guess, pretty as people would suppose it to be or want Mm -hmm. it to be, or uh, it's, it's much more boring than you would think in terms of just looking at it on paper, but um, it's what's worked and and what will continue to work as we move forward. Yeah. And I I love it as well. I don't mind doing the boring work. Like we talked about just a few episodes ago of how important that is um, for progress. Um, Then I was asked of how training has been recently health focused or still aesthetic goal. So again, still, still look at going for a look as well as just enjoying the training. What do you want to improve? Yeah. What are you wanting to improve? Sorry, I thought you said still wanting to improve. I was like, yeah, Um, I'm wanting to um, improve my my shoulders and my upper body. I've always loved upper body training, upper body. Um, And I feel like um, throughout prep itself and especially post-show, I've really connected more with my back and chest, which has been really fun to be able to um, just get into those movements. And like, like I said, train, like I love being able to learn more about my body or really get in there and get after something. Um, So I am excited because also going into this year, we have really thought about 
ourselves and being able to set appropriate boundaries within work and having a better balance for our mental health and our physical health and then our, the work aspect of it. And so I'm excited because I believe we will be able to titrate volume up just because we've done a good job of delegating as well as setting up our schedule in a better way. So I'm really excited for that. Um, and then I had a question of if I'll ever stop tracking macros or if I'll stop tracking macros anytime soon, and if so, how will I transition? Um, I don't plan on stopping tracking macros as of now, um, but I will say that, again, there's been days that I haven't tracked, and if you were to pull up my fitness pal, I used to have like some crazy 900 day streak or whatever it was. Um, but like I've had multiple days where I like go to add the food from the day before and it's like, you didn't track your food yesterday. Um, but then I scroll back and I realize like, oh, I've eaten the same like three or four meals with my fourth meal being a flex meal. Um, that's why I didn't track is because it was the same food every day. So that's how I would do um, just due to our routine and how we eat is that I would likely just end up eating the same foods in the same amounts. I still weigh my foods a lot of the time um, or most of the time and then just not physically tracking them in my fitness pal um, just because I have that experience of seven plus years of tracking macros um, and teaching other people how to track and all that jazz. What tracking macros is setting you up for is just simply monitoring your nutrition for the rest of your life anyway. And so you're technically going to track macros for forever. It's going to be in different capacities in different ways, um, but you're just building the knowledge to be able to have better control over what you're putting into your body as well as your body composition. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where people get a little lost of like, I'm either tracking macros or I'm not. It's like, you're just using tracking macros. It's like you're in elementary school, junior high and high school and in, into college. It's just part of the education to be able to have that nutritional freedom that we all desire. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not a matter of like, are you ever going to stop tracking macros? Like that, that shouldn't be your goal. Mm -hmm. It should be that you have so much knowledge within your nutrition and how your body responds to food that you're able to have control over your body composition, how you feel, and and those different factors by simply looking at the foods and understanding them mm -hmm. without the phone, without the app. And that's where we all want to be. And it shouldn't be a matter of like, I just want to never like open up the app again. It's like, yeah, I, I would love to not use my phone, you know, more consistently. Yeah. Like we all want to be off our phone more, but what are you doing when you're, are you just like mindlessly doing it? Or are you actually paying attention, looking at, okay, this is a hundred grams of banana. I know I, I have a visual image of what that looks like so that as I continue to do this, I do this another 50 times, a hundred times, 200 times that for the rest of my life, I'm gonna be able to look down and be like, eh, that's roughly about 100 grams of banana. Mm -hmm. That's what we're all looking for. Yeah, and I think a really great example, I just had in a client's check-in, she used to be very focused in the all or nothing mentality and we've worked a ton on getting her away from that headspace and just obviously the holidays went through and she had said in her check-in, I wasn't perfect with nutrition, which was never the goal for her to be perfect over the holidays, but I made mindful, conscious, um, small choices about my nutrition that I'm really proud of. And that's exactly what, what we're talking about here. And I asked her, I was like, can you elaborate on this more? Because I think it's going to be helpful for you to see it as well as I want to see how this has changed for you. And she was saying like, oh, while I enjoyed some sweets, I made sure that I got things that were higher in protein and veggies first. Or I went out to eat and I was going to get something I normally get, but I ended up getting the sandwich because it had a um, more protein on it and because it had avocado and I knew that getting the other meal was going to be too high of fats, but I still wanted fats and fats that I was going to feel good with. And then I got a side of sweet potatoes because I knew I needed more fiber with that meal. And I was just like, freaking bravo. That's like what I want your thought process to be is, okay, do I have the pieces of a meal that's going to make me feel my best? Even on Christmas, like we had that cheesecake monkey bread, if you saw that commercial that Miguel made. Commercial. Oh, well, basically. <laughs> 
basically. <laughs> Ad, promo, Instagram reel. I, saw, I thought it was funny that you <laughs> called it commercial right off the top. And uh, we had that for breakfast. And afterwards, Alex and I both ate more food to complement that. If that was more carbs and sugars and fats, which was completely fine to have. But we balanced that out by having some protein, some fiber, some, some other aspects to make us feel our best. And that's what I want and what we want clients to be able to grow from and learn from within tracking macros. So anytime that I wasn't per se tracking macros, I was still tracking what I was eating and being mindful and cognizant of what built out a meal instead of just eating junk or just not pay, not having progression. Because a lot of times people think, oh, if I'm not tracking, then I'm not doing all the other stuff with nutrition, like meal prepping and looking at menus and all that jazz. And I make it very clear of, if you're not tracking macros, you still need to be meal prepping. You still need to be getting food ready. And that's what helped me the most is we always had food meal prepped. And so it was just, okay, you eat the next meal and you keep going on from that. And that was so beneficial on those days where I wasn't technically pulling out my fitness pal to plug it in. Um, I got the question of if I find myself preaching different to clients now that I'm no longer in prep mode. I thought this was a really great question. I'm sure other people navigate through this um, when they're in prep or out of prep or just different seasons in life. You're going to coach a little bit differently, whether it's based on your experiences or what you're going through. Um, but I don't feel like my coaching has really changed um, within like how I talk from prep to not prep, just because I more so change how I I talk based on if the client is in prep or what that client's goals are. So if I have a client that has goals and they're in a lifestyle diet and they've expressed the goals that they're trying to reach, that's how I talk to them about things. Um, I didn't feel like I was more hardcore, you got to make it happen to all of my clients while I was in prep. I really tried to gauge where each client was and what their goals were and coach towards them specifically. Do you feel like you notice a difference of that for you in your life ever of like um, if you're in a dieting phase or not of like being more intense with clients or anything? I would say years ago. Yeah, I haven't had that in a long time. I would imagine that the the clients, I mean, it's been four years since I competed. Um, the clients that worked with me at that time could probably say that I was a little bit you know, shorter and uh, a little bit more like hard on them, I'd imagine, mm -hmm. if I look back and, and kind of think about that. Um, and, and then you also think about just the amount of repetitions, because a lot of your coaching experience is less about, or the the way that you coach is less about your personal um, experience and is more centered around the experiences that are brought to you from the clients themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I mean, think about all the experiences from all the different individuals that I've been able to uh, have brought into my life over the last four years with all the check-ins that I answer from a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month perspective. Um, my knowledge as well as my ability to coach has, has changed quite drastically. Yeah. Um, then I got some questions about kind of post-show of any body image str struggle or if it's been hard of not having the goal of stepping on stage again, um, the process of switching from what the judges want to what I want, um, as well as just, again, some questions of what are my physique goals without competing um, or what does it look like with a competition not on the horizon. Um, and like we've stated within training and nutrition, pretty similar. Again, it's my lifestyle and it's something that I the reason I went towards bikini specifically was not only because I felt it was attainable and realistic due to where I was willing to push within competing, um, as well as like what space held in my life, um, but also based on the look that I liked the most personally. And this isn't going to be the same for everyone, but even if your structure is possibly better suited for a different division, like I really went towards a division that I liked the look of and I liked the aspects of what muscle groups that they were really judging on stage. And so that was a huge benefit to me is like I already really gravitated towards that look. And I feel like I still aim for that look overall of being able to have muscles and have shape. And I love the look of muscles, um, but being able to really make sure that I'm honing in on exactly what I want and realizing that like smaller isn't always better or that like being stage lean doesn't equate to me being more worthy or looking better. Because I realized honestly, drastically that stage lean, I looked the best when I was 
unclothed, basically, like just in my posing, which is exactly how you're supposed to look. But when I was wearing normal everyday clothes, I didn't like how I looked. I felt that I was my face was way too sunken in and I looked too harsh and I really like was being swallowed by a lot of my clothes and I just didn't look the way that I wanted to look. Again, on stage and I was so so freaking proud of my physique, but being truthful truthful with myself and realistic for myself of how I want my physique to look when it comes to a day to day. I'm I'm very happy with the fact of again, I'm I'm still focusing on the muscle groups I want to grow of my glutes and my shoulders um, and some other um, like goals within my back here and there. Um, but also still like doing what is best for me and looking at the lifestyle that I want to live. I think that's the biggest thing post show is not being realistic with what you want your life lifestyle to look like and how that feeds into each other of I can't say I want all this flexibility with my life and I want to be able to do things without tracking in my fitness pal and all of that but still maintain a stage lane physique like those two don't go hand in hand and so like when people ask about competing or why I'm not continuing I always respond of like the cons started to outweigh the pros and that that's okay too I'm not saying competing is bad and that you should never do do it. I've had a very positive experience and I speak positively. We still have many competitors and we love being able to take them to stage. But for me personally, in my life, I had to be really honest with myself of the pros did start or the cons started to outweigh the pros. And I think that self-honesty and self-awareness has helped me so much post-show of just accepting what this is for me and being okay with that being my answer and not being upset that I can't have both. Um, so uh, that is kind of how I've navigated through this. So um, we are going to go ahead and wrap this up. I am going to record another short podcast kind of by myself, being able to talk about um, some things that have really helped me post-show of some key factors that I've written down um, that were, again, just really helpful as I reversed and as I went post-show um, and being able to outline those. But I think that this was great to be able to reflect on the, the coach aspect of things as well as the competitor aspect, um, as well as being able to just be like, open about like what my wants and my desires are moving forward within life and being able to just go after those and recognize that it's a chapter in my life that maybe it has a little um, bookier on it of uh, the pages just um, bookmarked, but maybe that chapter is closed and I feel confident and okay with that moving forward. Um, and I'm just really thankful for all of Alex's support throughout this process um, in so many different ways. Um, but like his support as a coach, his understanding and his knowledge as a coach to truly apply as well as being able to um, like take an approach that was going to work the best for me of where I was at. And then just how much he's been there for me throughout everything going on within my family um, and the, the cancer diagnosis. Um, as well as just like both of us being sick of how we've been there for one another and given the other person space and understanding when we're both going through a difficult time, as well as just all of the stress and things that have gone on within work aspect of like we've been able to, to touch base with one another um, and kind of uh, sort through the hats to figure out who we need to be for one another, which has been so like I mean, it's, it's invaluable. There's nothing else I can say about it except that. Um, so I've just been really thankful for that and glad that we get to keep doing life moving forward. I'm thankful for you. I think that the biggest thing with relationships in general is just the understanding of where you've got to show up more and support the other person. And and there's just a, a constant equilibrium that you're trying to maintain. And there's sometimes when, uh, you know, one partner is, is investing very heavily because the other partner is, is in a challenging spot with whatever it is. And that, that constantly is in flux. And I think that the, the greatest relationships are the individuals that are able to um, see that and be aware of it and navigate that to their best ability. And uh, that's something that we're just continuing to strive to improve upon every single day. And I think that this year, 2022 specifically, um, this year will obviously be great as well. But 2022 was, was one where we got significantly better in that 
at that, and it shows through our um, communication as as well as you know um, how we treat one another and all those things. Yeah. Well, here's to 2023 and all the goals that we have ahead. Um, thank you guys so much for the questions and just for being able to allow us again this space to navigate through everything and for all of your kind words with everything that's been going on as well. We really appreciate it. So if you could give us a, take a few minutes out of your day and go ahead and give this a thumbs up if you are watching it on YouTube or hit that subscribe button or leave us a comment being able to interact if maybe your post show or your first time competitor and these are things that you've been worried of or you've decided not to compete moving forward, whatever that may look like, we'd love to be able to hear from you. And if you are listening to this on a podcast platform, being able to give us a review, again, extremely helpful or share with a friend that you think that this would help as our main mission here within physique development is to train, educate, and empower in any way that we can do that for someone, we would love to be able to do so. Thank you guys so much.